A few years ago now, I was lucky enough to speak with you know the great Brad McQuaid, who who sadly we lost um, a, a few years ago as well. And Brad was working on a project that that we talked about, Pantheon: Rise of the Fallen, um, and that is a project that is still ongoing to this day. And I'm I'm lucky enough to be joined by the the lead on that project, Chris Jopper Perkins, and I'm I'm so happy to have you here today, Chris. Thanks so much for taking the time out for the show. Yeah, thanks for the invite. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, now, you know, it's really great to, to be able to check in here and and see how you guys are going because I do keep uh, tabs on everything. I check in on the subreddit. I, I watch the content that you guys uh, push out. I, I watch the content that the content creators push out as well, the unofficial stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm very much so a lurker. I'm, I'm sort of a... a bit of a bad guy in that regards. I don't give back. I don't post. I just read and read and read, but it's nice to sort sure. of see what's going on. I wanted to take the opportunity to to get to know you a little bit more and also get an update on the game. But um, let me first start out with, you know, how are you going with how much time has progressed? And, and I know that it must be so hard for you and the team to constantly juggle expectations with you know the the passage of time that has gone by which is you know i think it's fair to say is significant but also understandable um so how is everyone going i don't know that i can speak for everyone because there's there's a lot of people watching waiting and lots of different you know temperatures of uh you know everything from i i give up you know it's never going to happen to um you know, people who still are just for the first time hearing about the project. So um, as far as internally speaking, uh, you know, it doesn't feel to us like it feels to everybody else. Um, it may be a weird analogy, but if you have, you know, if you're my age, you know, late 30s, um, you're and you, you know, your parents are alive and you have regular interactions with them, you, you might have experienced the phenomenon of you know, them being at a point in life where a lot of what they're doing is just kind of waiting and they don't have a lot, you know, going on. Um, maybe they do, but, you know, um, whereas, you know, I have three children who are all still pretty young, married, you know, I obviously am very pissy. And so for me, every day is just like, boom, 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 just, just lightning fast. And everything is just, you know, absolutely barreling towards, you know, our, our goals. Whereas externally, it's like, you know, when are they going to call? <laughs> you know, when, are, when am I going to see them again? And uh, so it, it's internally, we are just, it's like a firecracker factory. You know, we're, we are just absolutely pushing every day, making great strides, very excited. Um, you know, this, this current stretch we're in specifically where, you know, we're got, you know, several new hires that we're, um, you know, coming towards the finalization uh, portion with and um, look to continue to expand the team even beyond that. And, you know, this year is a major year for us. And so there's, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of stuff going on, but um, it's, it's understandably difficult, you know, uh, on the outside looking in. Um, mm. So, yeah. I mean, I was going to ask about that. You've sort of lightly alluded to it. Um, I, I think the one thing that has been fantastic to see from from people that do frequent the subreddit and whatnot has been the communication of the progress and and the progress is now quite i think tangible you know you guys are um throwing out uh evidence of, of the team expanding of of zones you know clearly getting more work done on them and and uh you know graphical updates and networking updates which is fantastic if i can ask only if you're able to say you can tell me to get stuffed if you don't want to answer what what number is the team at now what have you guys expanded to we're about 35 people right now really okay that's that's i was expecting about 20 that's fantastic okay there you go um well it's really great to hear that that things are kind of you know onwards and upwards and and the team is uh getting a lot done I wanted to touch on, you know, I'm not so much going to dive into, I know it's sort of folly to go down the route of specifics on updates and when's what happening. And, and you must get so sick of talking about that. So I want to talk about you a little bit more, Chris, if that's all right. Um, sure. Because I, I find it fascinating to get a bit more of a background on on lead devs and what their inspiration is and 
and what they're playing and what they like playing, what they don't like playing, that to get a little bit of maybe an idea and speculation on the kinds of things we might just see in the game that you are helping create. So if I can ask, like, what are your favorite games of all time? Or And flowing on from that, what are you playing at the moment? Hmm. Um, so I'd have to start with the, the classic console games. Um, and th- I have a special relationship with them because, because of the way that they factor into the development of Pantheon. I think a lot of us, again, in you know this age bracket and kind of somewhere on either side of it, uh, have a pretty special relationship with you know the classic NES and Game Boy and going up through the you know those early consoles. Um, for me, you know the Zelda series, Mega Man, Metroid, um, Mario. You know these games mm. have done more to shape me than I think I realized, and um, you know particularly in the way that they inspire uh, some of the game design and I would say major portions of the DNA of our game. Um, in that it, it's fascinating to me to kind of chart how what we feel like are these very kind of packaged and you know encapsulated experiences in these console games actually have a pretty amazing um, interpretation into an MMO experience. Um, and a lot of Pantheon is is exploring um, how that Metroidvania uh, roguelike you know type. Uh, experiences can manifest in a much broader, larger scale and then imbued with a lot of that social energy as well. Um, but definitely, you know, EverQuest was a big one for me. Uh, you know, I was kind of right there um, at, at the launch of that game and it just hit at the right time. I think it was 13 maybe when that game launched. Um, and it was just, it blew my mind. I mean, it was just revolutionary in so many ways to just my experience of playing video games and being a virtual avatar and experiencing things through that. Um, so um, World of Warcraft is a big one as well. Um, it's funny to mention that at times with our particular community, because there's this concern, you know, it's not going to, uh, that, you know, we're, we're making meaningful deviations from um, that very successful and wonderful formula. Um, it's funny, Wrath of Lich King, I know that, that a lot of people are anticipating that right now. Absolutely pinnacle of, of the wow experience for me was um, Holy Paladin and Wrath, being able to raid as a Holy Paladin. I, I just absolutely loved it. Um, but um, as far as what games I'm playing now, um, then again, I'm 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 can be pretty verbose, so I am really trying to discipline myself not to go. No, 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 please me. go nuts. It is totally fine, mate. <laughs> but um it's an interesting like recipe right now. Um, you know, there's always the caveat that I don't have as much time to play games as I would like. Uh, but um, <laughs> it's going to sound funny, maybe. But the game that I'm playing right now is uh, Escape from Tarkov, and okay. um, I would have to honestly slot that in as an as an inspiration in a way because the reason that a game and I couldn't even tell you what made me try it because um, I'm not a huge FPS player, but um, there are things that that game evokes in me emotionally, viscerally, that no other game has ever done. And, you know, we talk about tension a lot in mm. Pantheon's framework. And um, that's one of the kind of classic era themes that we want to draw out. Um, but even in in that sense, like there's never been a more tense experience <laughs> than uh, Tarkov, where you can, I, I, when I first started playing, literally would sit in a bush for 30 minutes afraid to move because, mm. you know, it, anyway, that's a, that's a, that's one that, that I'm really enjoying, you know, as I get the chance now. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have an 11 year old son. So a lot of the game playing I do when I have time for that, I try to spend it investing in him and, and with him. And um, so, you know, Fortnite, Minecraft, uh, and the the like um, is you know some of the other things that I have going on, but it's yeah. funny just how and yeah. really in all these things there's very interesting points of inspiration that um, can come. I mean, I- I'll just give you an example. Fortnite, um, you know, you know, it's there's something about uh, some of the traversal mechanics in that game that feel really fun, and when it comes to Pantheon, a lot of it's funny how many times internally this conversation comes up, but I'm looking for fun 
the games are f- supposed to be fun. Hundred percent. And you know, fun can feel very. It can, it can feel very light as a word. It it can feel like it doesn't encapsulate like a depth of meaning that it actually really does because fun is connected to satisfaction. And I think as a, as an entity, we, as people are, we tend to hunt for satisfaction. We tend to hunt for fun. And um, so whenever, whenever anything in a game, even if it's not connected to the whole experience, but whenever there's anything that's fun that I just find myself enjoying doing, it's meaningful. And there's a point there to sit back and say, you know, it's not, it's not, and that's really the work of design is it's not that any of these things necessarily can just be picked up here and put there and and just fit and work. But there's, there's the work of exploring, like, what is fun about this and what makes this fun and MMOs, especially as a genre. um, I, I, I would challenge anybody that plays MMOs and it's not that there aren't people that have genuinely have fun. But I would challenge people to say, like, are you really having fun? Mm. Or how much of this has become just, I've played these games for so long and I know them and, you know, there's some measure of satisfaction or, you know, box checking that comes along with it. But am I really having fun? And anyway, that's just kind of a pivotal question that we we ask a lot. I'm I'm so glad to hear you raise that. And, and I can absolutely use that answer to segue into a direction that I was going. I mean, just to... to, to mention some of the stuff that you gave in your answer you know chris i'm around your age i'm 39 years old so everything you said completely resonated with me you know the nes was my first console as well my first gaming memory of all time you know i'm not afraid to say was almost rage quitting and crying because i couldn't get through a castlevania level um you know that was that was our generation and 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 i completely appreciate those journeys that we went on as well um, you know, it's really interesting to hear, and I am so glad you went down the path of saying that there are things outside of MMOs that you draw inspiration from. And when you say how you explain how you feel when you play uh, Escape from Tarkov, you know, I regularly say to people, it seems like something that shouldn't need to be said out loud, but whether or not we forget it. And you've mentioned that that keyword of fun. I often say to people, you know, we consume media to or art to feel something that that's why it's created whether it be movies television uh you know uh actual art like paintings or video games like we, we want to draw some kind of human emotion out of this and i think that you know the best i'm a big film fan the best film fans really make you emote openly at times and i would i'd enjoy the same things from my video games and it's something that i do think is getting a little bit lost in the weeds over time where games perhaps are forgetting, as you say, that either sense of fun or emotion over time. And I'm really glad to hear you say that that's something that's at the forefront of your mind, because I was going to ask you the question, how you and the team are kind of wrestling with, I'm trying to think of a a delicate way to say this, but I don't want to offend anyone, like the the, the the, (laughs) the scourge of the modern MMO player. And what I mean by that is, You know, times have definitely changed. You mentioned EverQuest, you mentioned WoW, you know, and through playing WoW Classic, it has become ridiculously evident to me that we have changed as gamers, not only the guys like you and me who are our age who have evolved over time, but also the younger players just come at it from a new angle now. And, and, you know, this ain't Kansas anymore kind of thing. Um we, we have situations now where people are so keen. I don't know whether or not it's time being so precious or whatnot, but, you know, the, the willingness to take shortcuts, the, the gold buying, the rush for that, they denounce it, but then they buy it. Um, you know, buying items in a game, raid logging. And as you say, I really boil it down to if you ask these people, are you having fun? They would say yes, but that definition of fun has changed and, and, um, kind of, I don't want to say being sullied, but it, it's almost, it's very different to what I think we used to say was fun. So how does Pantheon tackle this concept of whether it's combating or not, how the, the gamer in 2022 views MMOs? Great question. Ooh, great question. Um, I'll go faster if I take just a second to gather some No, thoughts. no, take your time. It's totally fine. So 
So in a, in a recent conversation I had uh, actually on the topic of soloing, and this was one of our, you know, official podcasts, um, hit on this a little bit. And it's, um, it's, when, when you look at the classic games, kind of the progenitors of the MMO genre, it, it was a, um, even going back and looking at something like EverQuest, you know, as, as kind of a preeminent example where a lot of people would say that was kind of a, uh, a, a more sandboxy, open, nonlinear type game. The reality is that it, it really was pretty linear in the sense that while you could, you know, go anywhere uh you wanted to as long as you could survive or you know whatever um it was it was leveling and then the end in game um and so i guess one of the most fundamental answers to that question is in our effort to explore the horizontal aspects of what these games can present because again going back to those points of, of fun and genuine enjoyment um a lot of people derive very deep satisfaction from we'll say the grind like i just want to i just want to progress i want to progress in you know whatever the the primary the principal way of progression is and let's say that's levels so i want to get to max level and then at max level i want to start getting the best gear i want to start min maxing my stats so, you know i want to like that's that's it and you know, even with that person, I would argue like, you know, is, is that really fun? And I, and I think it is, I think it is to the right person. And, and, you know, we're certainly going to have, have that. But um, w when you strip that primary progression path away and you look at what is the game, like, what is the experience to be had here? And I think for a lot of MMOs, you know, you can, you could point maybe to PVP and say, well, you know, and that's that's a very legitimate answer, and that's certainly a lot of fun. Um, but for us, it's been looking at okay, what are what are all the various aspects of horizontal experience that we can you know naturally imbue into this game in this world to where there are multiple avenues and in in roads to a fun aspect of the game that players can enjoy. Um, and so whether that's something with traversal, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, when you think about our climbing system, our swimming and some of the other special traversals like the animal taming and, you know, ability to ride, you know, things around that you just encounter in the environment and um, other things we haven't talked about yet um, that I'm super excited to be able to talk about because I think it'll just drive this point further home where you take a, just a bucket system or bucket mechanic like traversal, and you start extrapolating out what are all the the ways that we can make this really interesting and fun, and start opening up, you know, something for players to pursue that's not just the grind. And the key with something like that is you have to also thread it and weave it into a world that supports that being meaningful. Um, so you know, to go back to something like Fortnite, like I love being able to slide down hills in Fortnite. <laughs> it's just it's just one of those things it's like <laughs> this just makes sense it feels good mm. gives me a little bit of extra speed and boom um will that make it into pantheon i don't know but it's fun um but you know it's it's very compartmentalized in that game like it's like it's just but what if what if sliding like that because it sped you up a little bit gave you the momentum to maybe make it across a gap that you wouldn't be able to otherwise and what do gaps represent in MMOs, especially that are heavy and really, you know, emphasize adventure and discovery? Well, gaps represent potentially finding a whole new area that you didn't have access to before. And so now this fun mechanic actually is connected to opening the world up to you even more, which I would say, um, and I'm, I'm going to get back to the heart of your question too, about just like time investment and things like that, because I know that's a big part of this. But um, I, I want to make a game experience and and everyone working on this project we're we're dedicated to creating an experience in which the world has multiple ways and aspects of opening itself up to you more and more in a in a non-linear way um the biggest criticism i would have of a game like world of warcraft and and the like is that it is it is so pre-prepared your your path through the world your itemization 
I mean, there's never really a given point in time that you can't look at yourself and say, this is where I need to be and what I need to be doing. Um, or these are the places that I could be doing what I should be doing. And the itemization and everything else will be there to, you know, go right along with you as you advance. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll call that point number one. Um, point number two would be, you know, we are also taking time investment really seriously. And we've said for a long time now that we would, we're targeting a two hour time frame as kind of a core time frame that whether it be, you know, that leveling path or that progression, whether it be, you know, developing a, a new form of traversal or working on your climbing skill or, you know, trying to get a little bit deeper underwater or, um, you know, uh, building up your acclimation by spending some time in a cold area in preparation for, you know, some a new area that you want to try to explore later in the week or the perception system and just hunting for clues and things of interest or, you know, f finding, running through the orc camps and, you know, picking up the weapons off tables and salvaging them or um, the, you know, the different social aspects of the game uh, that, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on Th these, we want to make these things available to players. So even if they only have 30 minutes to log in, um, they feel like they're able to meaningfully progress on, on some kind of a horizontal pathway that still is part of advancing their character and opening the world up to them more. Very good. Thanks so much for that great answer, mate. Um, you know, I, I I, it, I'm glad to sort of not so much put you on the spot, but but put things to you that that maybe you know get get the uh, the brain in motion and and get you thinking. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you did so well. Thank you so much. And if I can pick up on a little tidbit you dropped there and and extrapolate, um, you know, it, gaming devs are historically and understandably, again, I'm not here to throw shade about this attitude, but gaming devs are historically quite averse to. Um, speaking negative, negatively about other games or other projects and things they don't like within gaming. It's, you know, every, it's a small industry. Everyone knows everyone. Focus on the positive and talk about what you like and build on that. Um, so it makes a question like this tough, but if I can somewhat ask to, to push you to be as candid as possible, when you, when you have, and you've clearly, you know, enjoyed other MMOs in depth over the years, you mentioned the Holy Paladin days, you enjoyed in Wrath, whether or not Beacon of Light is coming to Pantheon, we shall see. Um, but what are the systems that you've really, really not liked that you've engaged with over the years, whether it be, you know, other games, not so much on the whole, but something specific? Because I think of all that we're going through with WoW Classic at the moment, and everyone is getting this history lesson on how the game evolved, and they're trying to update the game to somewhat tweak some of the issues out on, on a small scale. But... I don't know whether anyone on the team plays WoW Classic or if you play WoW Classic or if you simply just remember. The things that you look back and you say, there is no, I don't want to swear with you, mate. I usually do because I'm a crass Australian, but there's no bloody way, I would have said something worse, um, we're putting that in Pantheon, whether it be X, Y, or Z. Dailies. Dailies, yeah. That's, okay. That's at the top of my list. Love it. Okay. It, 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 it reviled them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know that there's anything coming to mind that that I have as strong of a a feeling towards as as that, um, because it just plays on all the wrong. I understand. I think. I think someone was probably when they sat down and they said dailies, they were probably thinking like positive player retention. Like let's let's you know give people something to do. You know, make sure that they always have something to, something to do. I don't think yep. they realize like all of the negative things that they that that system actually praise upon maybe praise is, is too strong but, um, <laughs> I know what you mean. It, it just creates a very in my opinion a very negative relationship between the player and the game um right so okay fair enough right. that. yep yeah if i can jump in sorry please do keep going i was please, just gonna say no, you, you just reminded me because um you know one of your peers i i think it's fair to say um yoshi p on final fantasy 14 who gets so much love from his community um, has also been openly uh, vocal about pushing d devs away from making things that that make logging in a, a job or a, a, a uh, obligation as opposed to just logging in when you bloody want to. So it's good to yeah. hear that that's at the forefront of, of the team's mind as well. 
Yeah, we, we actually just had a conversation about that internally, literally about Yoshi P and, and that that very sentiment recently. And there's just a very big difference between having enough content for players to do who want to play like exorbitant amounts and invest crazy amounts of time, but to develop systems in a way in which it universally requires and creates this kind of, you know, chain link between a player and, and they're feeling like their need to log in. That's just, it's just not at all what games are supposed to be, you know, that they're, mm. they're, again, they're meant to be fun and uh, not something that, that preys on you and makes you feel like you can't engage with time you're trying to spend with family or a trip that you want to take or something that you need to really bear down on with work because you just feel I, I, I have to log in to do these things. I mean, obviously social pressure can kick in and, you know, join a guild and you know a little bit of what that that pressure is like but that's that's again that's a that's a social dynamic that can be navigated that's very different from a, a cold mechanic that just drives that kind of behavior so absolutely it's at the top of my list very um the, the other thing i would add not with near as much chagrin as, as i have towards dailies but i would say flying mounts is yeah. another one for yeah. me that's a very big no-no um fun yes it, it, and it's one of those rare times where i'd say yeah flying mounts are fun but um you know so is eating a lot of candy yeah, and you're on the right track yeah. absolutely yeah. <laughs> um that will yeah. resonate a lot with my listeners and it's funny because we talked about that with with the uh release of burning crusade classic about six months ago um one of my regular guests was was on here you know who, preaching that the players don't quite realize how bad flying mounts are for the game and it, yeah. it's understandable that there was a lot of pushback to that like you say people like eating candy no they're great they're wonderful it's fun blah 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 and very quickly the tune the tune changes over the months where they go oh yeah it was it was fun at first but now i get what you were saying so it's it's i'm glad to mm. hear you say that with pantheon out of interest before i move on anything any other kind of systems that you've kind of turned your nose up up at over the years if they're not mm. coming to mind it's all good Nothing that comes to mind. Okay, all good. Um, mate, if I can pick up on uh, something a little bit tangential. Um, were you much of a PvP player back in the day or to this day? Huge. Huge. Okay, because I was going to say that the escape from Tarkov hint, I was like, it, I, I get, I'm getting a, a, a whiff of a PvP player here for some reason. Okay, mm -hmm. that's really interesting to know because I'm someone who uh, did not engage in PvP at all for 15 years you know, two years ago or whatever, when Classic came out, I rolled on a PvP server, really wary of it. It took a while to warm up, but now I love it. I absolutely love it. And I've got this bizarre bloodlust for, for someone who's relatively calm and kind in real life. I'm an animal in, in this game now. Um, <laughs> but not, not to toxic levels, because I do take great umbrage, and this is where my question is going, I do take great umbrage with where PvP can go in games and the way in which players use this kind of sandbox to basically just grief people it's it's another way to uh tickle your troll you know bone if you will and it's interesting now that there are two camps on pvp it's let me do whatever i want to do if i want to you know stomp low level players all day that's my right as a player versus the no let's implement systems to actually stop this that's not actually pvp pvp should be somewhat of a fair fight um, I, I see games like Ashes of Creation coming along and it does seem like they're implementing systems to try and combat the, the noob stomping um, so that people are actually, again, able to have fun playing the game and, and engage in PvP on somewhat even terms or, you know, in like a dual type situation. What are your feelings on PvP? Because I, I very strongly feel that PvP has gone in the wrong direction. Like, I don't like to see the toxicity that comes with PvP. Um, but... I understand that there is a fair point against what I what I think. Where do you sit on this, and what's Pantheon doing with it? If you are, and I believe you are, to have a PvP server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's the first point to make is that you know, you know, uh, I think opt in is important with PvP. Um, Pantheon is a PVE focused game in the sense that you know the the. Um, PvP, PvE servers and the PvE game is the core and the focus of what we're, we're building. Now, 
I believe that Pantheon stands to have some amazing PvP content and experiences because of the nature of the game and the way that the world and everything I just was talking about, about the horizontal progressions, the way the world can open up to you more and more, the deep faction system. Um, there are so many things to leverage, so many things to interact with in a PvP sense when you factor in the PvE elements. But I believe opt-in is absolutely key. So you know, Tarkov, for example, when I load up Tarkov, I do so knowing what I'm getting myself into. Um, I do it with the mindset that I'm, I'm about to you know, lose a year of my life um, and get some more gray hair like that. I, I am prepared for that. Um, but even in that game, you know, they do some interesting things with like the scav uh, faction where, you know, as a as a scav and I'm to take too long to go through the details, but they do a really cool job of, uh, you know, even in that environment, making you not necessarily just pray and grief other players just because they're there and you can shoot them because now you have kind of a reputation to be mindful of. And that reputation matters enough where you, you don't want to just stomp all over everyone. Um, uh, voice proximity chat is a huge, huge, huge element of what makes Tarkov such a special experience. And it's, you know, caused me to do some thinking about, you know, what places that have been in MMO as well, um, again, as an opt-in type system. I mean, that's a breeding ground for toxicity if you can't opt out of that or hearing something like that. But um, I think these survival-based kind of sandbox RPG, PvP, FPS, whatever the moniker is going to end up being for these games, I think they're on to some things that are pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it, I, it needs its own server. Um, in Pantheon, if you're going to PvP, you need to know where to go and go in with the right mindset. and. On those servers, we're free as developers to make it as crazy as we want and go as deep as we want and uh, have some pretty big plans for that. Well, and that's sort of the, the last offshoot of that is when you opt into that server, is the plan to have it be open slather? Um, it, it's going to be, it's going to vary. So, you know, I guess the, the, the easiest way to put it would be we would want to have options that accommodate for people who want the more of a casual PVP experience where there's more guardrails, more constraints, things that, um, you know, allow you to carve out a little bit more of a um, PVE friendly experience and all the way to, you know, the other side of the spectrum where it's just, you know, hmm. a little slaughterhouse. <laughs> now, Chris, I am um, mindful. Sorry, I keep calling you Chris, by the way. I, I, I should say Jopper. I, I do lean on first names. I find it a bit more. Uh, Chris is fun. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Um, Look, I, I am mindful of the time. I, I know it's been half an hour. I've got one more question lined up. Are you okay to, to go a little bit longer? Is that all right? Yeah, we'll do one more. Yeah, one more question. Thanks so much. Um, look, I, I just wanted to get this one out there. I, I, I do apologize. I've forgotten the name of the system, but Pantheon has this really, really intriguing system that I love to see um, with the, the AI with your mobs and how they basically change their personalities and the way in which they will attack you and approach your party. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I... I I love seeing that kind of innovation. I, I see things like that and I think, you know, where has this been? I often see things come up in MMOs where I go like, I, and please correct me if another MMO has done this, but I go, why did it take 20, 30 years for this to come up? This is amazing. I'm glad these guys thought of this. I'm glad they're going to do it. Um, but with that, I'm sure comes a little bit of, I don't want to say fear, but like maybe trepidation about innovating in that way you know so many mmos like to just take what another game has done and you know whether it's a copy of pay and paste or a slight twist but basically the same thing implement similar systems that work in their games when you are saying no we're bringing in something completely new um how how scary is it for the team to do that versus you know playing it safe with what we know I would, I think I would start by answering that. I would start answering that by downplaying it a little bit. Like I, I wouldn't call it an innovation. I would call it an evolution. And I think in doing so that kind of probably helps see how we could have come, you know, to the, an idea like this because um, it, it literally... Well, I mean, to go all the way back to the the first kind of inspiration for it, it, it was it was literally like you know, we would like to see NPCs react to the environments that they're in. So, um, 
if you're down deep in some abyss where there's very, very little light, then if you pull out a torch, it would make sense that the NPCs would respond to that. You know, maybe they scatter, uh, maybe they, you know, they have some kind of a response. And so um, that's kind of where it started. And that was more, you know, an exercise in just exploring the the immersion factor that we want to try to create with the game. But from there, it kind of began to evolve and, and, and you know, the I, I can't recall exactly what the steps were, but it was a process of, of wrestling with this idea that, you know, part of what MMOs struggle with is because they don't have an end, you're going through the experience over and over again. And instances, I think, are at, at the greatest risk of player fatigue because they are the same thing over and over and over again. And um, raids are often the same way where once you learn the mechanics and there's, there's some, you know, some good to that, you know, I, I've mastered this and now I can execute, you know, at a really high level and there's some satisfaction there and some, some enjoyment there. But um, that, that thought soup of like, how do we shake that up? How do we, how do we keep this game from becoming rote? And something about like the combination of you know npcs behaving believably and and responding believably to different stimulus or different aspects of their environment or changes in that environment led to just the simple idea that you know you know what if the, yeah i mean if you're down deep in the heart of a cave like most things would be pyrophobic let's say because of where they live but what if that just kind of bled out into the greater population of npcs and all of a sudden you have the opportunity for an NPC to spawn with a particular peculiarity or you know aspect of their behavior that will cause them to respond in strange, peculiar, unpredictable ways. And then you get kind of that tried and true unpredictability of just spawn chance. And um, you know, what it's not only the different combinations of dispositions you might see, which is the name of the system, but it's also what dispositions are spawning with what other dispositions. And are there synergies there? Are there things that actually benefit the NPCs or are there things that are detrimental to the NPCs? Um, we've got a couple of cases right now where we've got, uh, for, for example, um, a drowsy disposition where if, if, it is, if an NPC spawns with a drowsy disposition, then they can, you know, fall asleep standing up or mid attack or whatever, you know, from time to time. Um, and if you're, you know, you, you would know then, okay, I need to, if I've got a drowsy NPC, I want to take advantage of that by pulling an NPC that's able to cleave away from it because that cleave, you know, would hit that NPC in that state. Um, and or you have NPCs that are able to recognize other NPCs who are asleep and wake them up. Um, we have a, a couple of NPCs that do that right now, actually, where they'll they'll recognize a, a sleeping NPC and wake them up. And so you want to. It, there's just so many different ways and, and combinations that it plays out. And so it's just kind of a system that's taken on a life of its own. Um, and there's there's other things we want to do there too. Lore is a great way. You know, it MMOs typically give you all of the, this is what this thing's about as you lead up to it. Um, you know, by the time you fight uh, the Lich King, for example, you, you've gotten doused in that whole story. And it's it's amazing. I mean, it's one huge credit I would give to to wow and and the wow team throughout the years is their i mean the writing and the story and the world that they've woven together is absolutely absolutely fantastic um but you know we we're it's another example of how one of the ways we can keep these things from getting wrote is instead of it all being revealed to you right away it's a boss that you're probably going to be killing multiple times so why not reveal that lore more and more over time um to the player and so that way you know, it's not just the loot, but it's also the lore, the context, the story that is serving as a carrot. Um, the more and more that you you do this fight, or you you know spend time in this area, so um, multiple systems we're working on and trying to employ that mm. help keep things from becoming too routine. Oh, that's great to know. Look, the the disposition system just sounds phenomenal. I look forward to running into narcoleptic NPCs for sure. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm sure it's a lot of fun for the programmers to work on that as well. Has it been technically challenging for them? You know what? No. Uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of things in these games, um, you know, the tooling that supports it can can be challenging. But uh, once that's in place, especially with 
you know, our programming team, they've done an amazing job at creating a very scalable, uh, node based, no code, very designer friendly way of, you know, setting these things up, experimenting. Um, um, I would, I mean, there are some things that are challenging, absolutely, but I would say that surprisingly has not, has not been. Very good. Look, Chris, we'll wind it up there, mate. You've given me 10 more minutes than, than I should have gotten. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you so much for everything. I, I hope you went okay. I, usually I get devs on who don't know anything about me. And at the end I get the, uh, and, and, and don't feel compelled to say this, but I usually get, you know what? That was, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. That was actually kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a great job. These were great questions and you asked them in a way that felt kind of fresh and exciting and fun for me to answer. Um, I love, uh, you know, what I've heard about the podcast and I think it's a cool kind of angle that you take. So I would love to, you know, be back down the road when there's more to talk about because I really enjoyed it. Beautiful. You're in trouble now. You shouldn't have said that because I will absolutely invite you back, mate. We'd love to check in with you in the future. I will keep tabs. Everyone, as you've heard, Pantheon Rise of the Fallen is the game. Look up the uh, the official website, look up the subreddit, check out YouTube. It's all there, all the information you need. Chris and the gang are doing a great job. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, thanks everyone. Mate. I'll talk to you later, Chris. I'll, I'll check in with you a bit down the track. Sounds great. Thanks, mate. Bye.